So welcome everybody. Thank you for being here on this final Tuesday Hanover seminar. Um, every year, we, or I should say every semester, we try to have um, at least one graduate student presenter. So we're lucky enough that Siobhan was willing to present her work as that graduate student this spring. Um, so many of you have, I think, known Siobhan for a while now as she's worked in the department advised by Karen Potter Witter um, and is, I believe, wrapping up her dissertation fairly soon here and will be presenting a, a piece of that dissertation today. Um, so Siobhan, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself further and dive right into your presentation. Um. Thank, thank you, Emily, for uh, the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shivan Jesse. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate here in the Department of Forestry. Uh, and today I'll be sharing with you all uh, a research project that I've been working on for the past few years. Um, it is about logging businesses in the Lake States region of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the status of logging industry uh, in the Lake States region, the issues, and economic effect. So, here's an outline uh, for my presentation today. I will start by uh, talking briefly about uh, forest in the Lake States region and uh, forest products industry, then move on to talking about uh, logging businesses uh, specifically, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about economic effect of logging businesses uh, in the Lake States region, and then uh, key takeaways from today's presentation. So um, the Lake State region of Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin uh, is pretty rich in uh, forest. Uh, forest uh, land covers 55 million acres of uh, uh, total land area in these three states, a little more than half of uh, total land area in Michigan, almost half in uh, Wisconsin, and 35% in Minnesota. Uh, if you look at the table here, uh, you can see that uh, timberland ownership uh, is uh, mostly um, owned by private forest landowners in Michigan and Wisconsin. It's pretty similar in these two states, followed by state and local government and federal government, respectively. In Minnesota, uh, ownership is kind of evenly divided between private forest landowners and state and local government. Growth to annual uh, removals ratio, when you look at that uh, in the forest of all these three states, uh, growth exceeds the removals, almost double in Minnesota. And in Michigan and Wisconsin also growth is much higher than removals. Um, in Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, Maple Beach, Birch and Oak Hickory are the major forest type groups. And in Wisconsin, um, uh, in Michigan and Wisconsin, Maple Beach, Birch, and uh, Oak Hickory are the major forest type groups. But in Minnesota, uh, Aspen, Birch, uh, and Spruce fir uh, are the major forest type groups. And when you look at market uh, for uh, industrial roundwood, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin are more alike. In both of these states, uh, pulp mills are the major market. Uh, in Michigan, based upon timber product output report data for 2014, uh, we see that much of the industrial roundwood that's harvested uh, goes to sawmills, uh, followed by pulp mills and composite panel mills. This table here shows economic contribution of uh, forest products industry in each of the three states' economy. Uh, these numbers are derived from a recent report uh, published by uh, Lee Percy 2020. If you look at the employment data, we see that a forest products industry employs over 40,000 people in Michigan, um, a little more than 34,000 in Minnesota, and 67,793 in Wisconsin. Now, including a ripple effects, uh, the total uh, employment is over 91,000 in Michigan, 78,000 in Minnesota, and more than 160,000 in Wisconsin. In terms of output or total sales uh, from the forest products industry, direct contributions are 12.2 billion and total contributions are 20.2 billion in uh, Michigan. Likewise, it's uh, 18 billion in total contributions uh, in Minnesota and uh, close to 40 billion in Wisconsin. So why I'm showing these numbers is 
because these uh, data show the importance of forest products industry in each of the three states' economy. Now, uh, the logging businesses are an essential component of the forest products industry. These are the people who are responsible for connecting our forest resources with the forest products industry. They harvest timber from uh, different land ownership groups, and then they supply to primary uh, wood using mills, which in turn supply to secondary wood using mills uh, that produce uh, products that all of us use in our everyday lives. And so uh, just by uh, their actions in the forest, uh, these loggers are helping to meet uh, our demand for wood products. They're helping land managers, uh, forest management objectives. And uh, they are also, uh, because they're working in the forest, they also help to maintain uh, the health and productivity of forest resources, not only for present, but also for uh, future use. So, a strong and uh, competent logging sector is essential not only for vibrant forest-based economy, but also for sustainable management of forest resources. And so the importance of uh, logging businesses has, has been realized by academia, by industry, by landowners. And uh, over the past 40 years, there have been a number of studies uh, in Lake State region, as well as across the country, which uh, look at uh, the health and viability of logging sector. Uh, particularly in Michigan uh, and Minnesota and Wisconsin, these are the years where uh, past assessments have been done. But most of these studies have concentrated on uh, state-specific uh, data. So these are important uh, studies to analyze uh, what's the condition of logging businesses within state. Uh, but because of the proximity of forest, uh, what's harvested in one of these lake states moves uh, to the other states. And so we wanted to do a, a comprehensive um, study of logging businesses uh, in the lake state region. And that was uh, the motivational factor uh, for, for this study that uh, I'm presenting today. And um, past state level uh, surveys, uh, we couldn't compare uh, state by state. We didn't, couldn't do apple to apple comparisons with the past data because of the time frame, the data were collected, those varied, the survey instrument varied, focus of the study varied. And so uh, we wanted to do a comprehensive uh, study of logging businesses in these three states. Now, uh, some of the challenges uh, that logging businesses are facing based upon past uh, a survey of logging businesses, past studies, uh, are listed here. These include declining wood markets, increase in operational cost, um, fuel, equipment, all of those, uh, stumpage prices, access and availability issues, um, recruitment and retention of skilled workers. Logger, logging businesses are struggling to do that. Uh, and they're also facing uh, challenges uh, to work in changing weather environment uh, and also cost of complying with environmental regulations and forest certification. Now, um, the objective of our study was to develop a baseline data set of logging business matrix across the region in order to have a better understanding about business attributes, owner demographics, harvest potential, equipment infrastructure and challenges, as well as opportunities facing the industry. And we also wanted to compare capacity and structure of logging businesses among states. So what we did was uh, we did a coordinated mail survey of logging businesses um, in these three reasons. Uh, so based upon past uh, state level surveys, survey instrument was developed uh, uh, individually for each state. But then this time what we did was um, for a majority of the questions, we worded it consistently so that cross state comparison of the data could be done. And also uh, we could pull out uh, these uh, uh, commonly worded questions and run composite analysis to look at a uh, regional picture of logging businesses. Um, the method that we used for uh, survey administration was uh, Delman's Taylor design method. Uh, our sample size for Michigan was 1,085 logging businesses. In Minnesota, it was 383 logging businesses and Wisconsin, 911 logging businesses. We collected data on a broad suite of areas, including production levels, um, stump resources, equipment mix, capital investment, um, operational capacity, profitability, plans for business, and factors influencing recruitment of logging workforce. So after we collected the data, uh, we um, 
compared the first 25% of respondents in each state uh, with uh, last 25% of the respondents to see if there was any non-response bias uh, in the obtained data set. Uh, that is uh, based upon a study uh, con that was published in 1977 by Armstrong and Overton, uh, which mentioned that uh, late respondents are like non-respondents, so they can be used as a proxy for non-respondents. So that was the method that we adopted uh, to check for non-response bias. And we didn't obtain any uh, non-response bias in any of the states. Uh, and I forgot to mention this, that we did survey in uh, spring of 2017, and we asked logging businesses to report numbers for 2016 calendar year. Our analysis unit were uh, logging businesses. Uh, we converted all the volumes on cord basis and deleted responses that uh, reported less than 100 cords harvested in, uh, in 2016. Uh, then we did uh, descriptive and inferential statistical methods. We applied those to uh, check for across, uh, uh, across state comparison of the data. Uh, so if the data was uh, continuous and normally distributed, we used analysis of variance followed by Tukey test. If it was uh, continuous but non-normally distributed, we used Kruskal Wallis test uh, followed by Man Whitney with one per corrections. For categorical data, we used a chi square test. Our response rates um, were 23% for Michigan, 39% for Minnesota, and 63% for Wisconsin. Um, total usable responses after uh, removing undeliverable addresses were 550. And um, for composite analysis, uh, to be more representative, we weighed the total volume um, uh, harvested based on USDA forest status update 2016 reports. Here are some of the findings. Uh, so what we found was uh, average logging business across the region was 27 years old, and majority of them were family businesses, meaning that at least uh, two people from the family uh, were in uh, running the business and in leadership position in the business. 63% um, had one owner, 21% had two owners, and the remaining had three or more owners. If you look at the graph here, a majority of logging businesses in our study reason uh, had been in existence for 20 years or more. Uh, and there are very few that had opened in the last 10 years. We also looked at uh, owner's age. So average logging business uh, owner in our reason was 54 years of age and had 32 years of experience in logging business. Again, the graphs here, so uh, this distribution according to owners age, and we see that a large percentage of the owners were either 55 years of age or uh, more than that. And a small percentage, less than 5% were, uh, almost 5% were less than 35 years of age. So there are two important things to note from this uh, graph here. It's that uh, there's lack of young leadership in logging uh, profession. And uh, since there are so many uh, logging business owners who are in this older age groups, uh, they are more likely to see retirement uh, in near future. And so success and planning is going to be a uh, concern in the years to come. Collectively, the logging uh, businesses in our uh, study region harvested 4.8 million cords, which is 65% uh, of total volume harvested in the region during 2016. And um, per business, uh, the average volume they harvested was 9,000 cards with a median of 4,000 cards. Uh, there was no significant difference in the total volume harvested uh, across states. We, the graph here shows uh, our respondents. We categorize the respondents based upon how much volume they harvested, so small producers versus large producers. These five categories denote uh, those harvesting 100 to 1,000 cards, 1,001 to 5,000 cards, 5,001 to 10,000 cards, 10,001 to 15,000 cards, sorry, and more than 15,000 cards. And uh, the, this axis here gives percent of harvest volume. So we see that majority of our respondents uh, were small producers who produced less than 5,000 cards, 55% of them. And they harvested a small percentage of total volume harvested. So they harvested 11% of the total volume. Uh, but the largest producers who harvested more than 15,000 cords in 2016, uh, there were 13% of them, uh, but they harvested 58% of the total volume produced in the region. 
So what this shows is that despite the presence of many small logging businesses um, across the Lake State region, market is dis disproportionately dominated by few large producers who seem to have an advantage over smaller producers. Uh, it could be because of the economies of scale, it could be because of allocative efficiency, maybe they can hire and retain uh, employees better than the small businesses, they have better access to uh, prices and markets. Uh, these things we can say because, uh, because these were the kind of responses we obtained in, uh, uh, in the written segment of uh, our survey from logging businesses. We also looked at the harvesting system used and found that about a quarter of the responding businesses harvested timber exclusively using chainsaws, uh, but the percent of total volume harvested by chainsaw was very small, 10%. Um, cut to length harvesters, 54% uh, of the volume was harvested using this method and uh, fellow brunchers, 36% of the volume. Now, if we look at uh, this data uh, per state, then um, Michigan and Wisconsin are more unlike. Uh, so in both of these states, uh, majority of the volume was harvested using cut to length harvesters. And in Minnesota, most of the volume, more than 70% of the volume was harvested uh, uh, using um, fellow bunchers. Also a significantly higher percentage of volume in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin was harvested using chainsaws as compared to Minnesota. We looked at the source of stumpage and uh, how um, logging businesses acquired their stumpage. So uh, we found that uh, more than two thirds of the stumpage harvested uh, in the Lake State region was self-purchased by logging businesses. Um, this uh, varies significantly from um, what goes on in US South um, because in US South, most of the volume, uh, most of the stumpage is um, purchased by wood brokers and then loggers uh, negotiate a wooden uh, cotton haul rate with wood brokers. But uh, in the Lake State reason, uh, more than two thirds of our respondents said that they uh, purchase uh, their own stumpage. This, uh, this can give advantage to uh, logging businesses because they can negotiate uh, their own price and they can cut out the middle entity. So transaction cost is lost there. So that could be, that could increase their profit potential. Uh, and also they can, uh, that gives them more independence to uh, conduct their harvesting operations. Um, but then there's uh, another point to it, another side to it, which is that uh, they'll probably need uh, more, uh, more experience and more capital to purchase their own stumpage. So that could be a downside as well. <laughs> We also looked at um, um, the source of stumpage and found 56% uh, of the total volume harvested in the region came from non-industrial private forest. Um, uh, the second uh, source was uh, state forest and county forest. Again, this data varied by uh, states. So uh, Michigan and Wisconsin were more alike. Um, majority of the volume in this significantly higher percentage of volume in these two states were harvested from non-industrial private forest compared to Minnesota. Whereas in Minnesota, a significantly higher percentage of volume was harvested from a state and county forest uh, compared to Michigan and Wisconsin. But that uh, aligns with uh, forest ownership patterns in, um, in these three states. Next, we asked them um, to report the age of newest piece of mechanized uh, felling equipment uh, within the business and found that across the region, cut to length harvesters uh, uh, were 8.6 years of age and fellow bunchers were 13.8 years. Uh, so that means that mechanized felling equipment are uh, approaching uh, or even exceeding uh, uh, limits of their productive age. Uh, and that can have negative implications on uh, um, operational capacity uh, and efficiency of logging businesses in the future because older equipment may mean that more, uh, more downtime would be required for maintenance and breakdown of these equipment in the future. Also, uh, we looked at percentage of volume transported uh, by company-owned mills, as well as uh, uh, by subcontracting tracking services, and found that 54% uh, of uh, the volume uh, was transported uh, by company by contracted trucking services, uh, whereas 46% was transported by uh, company-owned trucks. Uh, Again, Minnesota um, transported significantly higher percentage uh, of the volume harvested using company-owned trucks compared to both um, Michigan and um, uh, Wisconsin. We also asked logging businesses how much capital was invested in their logging business. Uh, and 
if you see here, majority of the respondents said that um, $500,000 or less capital was invested in their business. Uh, but 13% said at least 1 million was invested in their business. And uh, much of the capital uh, was tied up in equipment and transportation equipment, uh, equipment and transportation, and 28% uh, was used for a stumpage. This doesn't add up because the others were for other miscellaneous purposes. And so what we get from here is that a very high amount of um, capital is invested in, um, in fixed cost. So that could mean that uh, it increases production capacity of logging businesses. But then uh, if there is a high capital tied to, um, you know, to the fixed cost, uh, then uh, logging businesses are also more likely uh, to take up um, uh, business that may not be as profitable because um, the cost of idling equipment could be higher than uh, undertaking uh, businesses that are not so profitable. Uh, so that's a point that we should note here. Um, we also asked logging businesses uh, to report their operational capacity and profitability. So we asked them, given their uh, labor availability and equipment, as well as site and uh, weather conditions, uh, if they operated at full capacity in 2016 or not, and found that majority of our respondents did not operate at full capacity. Only 37% said that they operated at full capacity um, in 2016. Uh, so uh, if businesses operate at less than full capacity, less than their um, uh, capacity, that, that produces their profit potential. But it may not always be possible to operate at full capacity given the um, adverse weather conditions or uh, equipment breakdown and many other things. And uh, for those who didn't operate at full capacity, we asked them how much additional volume could they produce if they operated at full capacity and found that uh, across the region, um, these businesses could produce additional 1.3 million cords. Uh, so uh, if there is increase in demand, then uh, it seems like uh, there's still uh, uh, capacity there. So uh, that's not a problem at the moment, well, at the time of the survey. Um, we also asked profit levels. Uh, 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 we asked respondents to rate their profits. Uh, uh, this is self-reported profit level. So we asked them to rate it from a scale of one to five, one meaning uh, very poor to five meaning excellent. Uh, and uh, the median response was average or broke even. Those uh, saying that they have, the profits were poor or very poor and good or excellent were uh, almost evenly distributed. <coughs> Next, we asked logging businesses uh, their short-term plan for the future. Uh, we asked them uh, in five years time, do you see yourself in the logging business or do you intend to exit from the market? To this majority of our respondents said that they would continue logging, but 27% of the businesses said that they, uh, they intend to exit from the uh, market uh, in five years time. And these indicated departures account for 11% of total volume harvested and 18% of capacity in the reason. We also asked businesses what their uh, firm success and plan was. To this, 38% uh, of our respondents here said that uh, most likely uh, somebody from the family would take over ownership of this, their business once the current owner retired. But uh, more than 50% uh, said that uh, no, either no one was going to take over the business once the current owner retired or they did not know it. So. There's uncertainty there. Now, logging business literature uh, across the country notes that, uh, that these businesses have difficulty finding um, new workers and also retaining those already uh, in profession. Um, but uh, these studies also show that uh, logging um, is a, a a business that is handed over from family from uh, family to family. So um, familial ties uh, tend to play a key role in uh, people joining the business. That's that's what we uh, thought from uh, literature. And so we asked logging uh, businesses uh, if they intend to, uh, if they would encourage family members or close friends to become a logger in the future. Uh, and only a small percentage said that they would. 20% uh, said they would. 
50%, almost 50% said uh, they would not, and 31% were unsure about it. Similar results were found by Egan and Tagart in New England uh, region uh, from their study in 2004. And, uh, and again, another study was conducted by Benjamin uh, and Leon in 2012, looking at logging businesses in the northeast, uh, northeastern states of US. And uh, they also found that uh, these familial ties are probably weakening in, uh, in recent times. Next, uh, we provided our respondents with nine different factors and asked them to uh, rate uh, if these factors uh, were important or uh, not at all important in their decision uh, to join logging profession in the first place. So these were like a type questions. Uh, we, we provided them again, nine different uh, factors and asked them to rate it on a scale from one to five, one meaning not at all important to five meaning extremely important. And we saw that uh, three of the factors uh, that we provided were rated as uh, very important by uh, our respondents. These included, uh, I enjoy a sense of independence, I enjoy working outdoors, and it gives me a sense of accomplishment. So similar kind of findings uh, were reported by other studies, uh, again, in New England and Northeastern uh, United States. And so also from our uh, conversation with loggers and uh, the, the written responses they sent to our survey, uh, it, it seems like the loggers look at logging profession as a way of life instead of just a, just a job. And these are the factors that they value, being their own boss and working outdoors. We also uh, provided eight different factors and asked our respondents to rate it on a scale of one to five. These were the factors uh, we're trying to gauge if they encourage or discourage entry of new people into the logging business. And uh, none of the factors we provided, uh, none, of the, none of these eight factors we provided uh, ranked higher than three, which is neither encourages nor discourages. Work environment was right and thus cost like Three, it neither encourages nor discourages entry of new people into business. All other things, including peer wages, benefits package, health of the industry, uh, all of these things were found to discourage entry of new people uh, into the logging profession. Okay, so uh, next I'll briefly show uh, uh, how small producers varied from uh, larger producers in our study region. So we separated our respondents into five different categories, again, based upon their um, uh, volume production in 2016, those harvesting 100 to 1,000 cards, 1,001 to 5,000 cards, 5,001 to 10,000 cards, 10,001 to 15,000, and more than 15,000 cards, and looked at some of the uh, industry and owner demographics. So uh, this year shows. Uh, uh, average age of the owners uh, by harvest category. Uh, so if you look at the graph here, we see that um, compared to small producers, larger producers tended to have uh, relatively younger uh, owners. Again, we looked at, um, uh, we looked at um, the newest piece of equipment they own and found that uh, larger logging businesses tended to have uh, newer pieces of equipment compared to small producers. So cut to length harvester age here is uh, for a smallest category, it's 17 years, 23 years here versus three years and six years for the largest uh, producers. We also looked at uh, the percentage of volume they harvested from private woodlands. Uh, and saw that uh, our small producers, those harvesting less than 1,000 cards, 78% of their volume came from non-industrial private forest as compared to larger largest uh, group here, which harvested only 35% of the volume from uh, private woodlands. And uh, also uh, those operating at full capacity, when we look at uh, these numbers uh, by harvest category, uh, a higher percentage of uh, the respondents in larger um, um, harvest categories said that they operated at uh, full capacity as compared to small producers. Uh, those indicating to exit from the market, when we look at that, we see that, uh, again, considerably higher percentage of small producers intend to exit from the market in the, uh, in the next five years as compared to uh, large producers. And those indicating to uh, 
transfer family, uh, transfer the business to uh, somebody within the family. Uh, when you look at that data by harvest category, we see that uh, for largest producers, 69% said that somebody within the family was going to take over the business once the current owner retired, as compared to 16% for the smallest producers. So the key takeaways from here uh, is that there are many similarities between uh, logging businesses, um, among logging businesses between states. Uh, markets are dominated by a few large producers who seem to be younger in age, have higher amount of capital invested in their business, uh, own newer piece of equipment, and uh, are operating at better operational capacity and probably are getting preferential treatment from mills. And there are small logging businesses uh, that harvest major share from NIPFs, and these are more likely to exit uh, from market in the short term future. Uh, so if these businesses uh, do actually exit from the market, then it can have negative implications on uh, forest management and smaller size uh, non-industrial private forest uh, in the study reason. Uh, also, businesses and business owners across the region are aging, and so success in planning is going to be of concern in the years to come. Uh, so that uh, that uh, signifies that maybe attention should be paid to get the new generation ready for um, business takeover, whether it be through some kind of um, training or um, some support for successful planning decisions to these uh, already existing businesses. Uh, so there seems to be that need. And then uh, majority are producing below full capacity and are uh, generating average profit levels. Uh, that also again hints at uh, maybe something should be done to increase the productive capacity of uh, these existing logging businesses so that they can they can be profitable and continue to remain in business. It could be through um, investing in uh, newer, better equipment, uh, could be through a long-term fiber contracts with the mills, uh, or maybe even relaxing uh, re restrictive uh, harvesting policies whenever it's possible. And uh, because there, there doesn't seem to be that many enticing factors to attract new people into logging business, there, there seems to be uncertain, uh, uncertainty about the future. Currently, uh, most of the um, most of the loggers are white males. Maybe in the future we could look at diversifying uh, the workforce. Maybe maybe include more women or people from other races, and also uh, think about who is coming into the business and um, maybe approach younger generation with more more technologically uh, savvy ways. Maybe approach them through uh, social media um, and the internet and those kind of things may help in the future. Let me check this chat and see. Uh, okay, Georgia asked a question, is there any particular reason why response rate was so much higher in Wisconsin? Uh, well, the difference was that uh, in Wisconsin, uh, with the first mailing of the survey, they sent out $2 bill. I don't know if that helped with the response rate or not, but uh, another reason could be that they have a, they have a good record of um, logging businesses uh, within the state. That that could be that could have been helpful in increasing the response rate because in Michigan uh, the list that we had was uh, pretty old and it needs to be updated, and that resulted in uh, I think lower response rate uh, in case of Michigan one of the reasons for that. Okay, I will move on. Next, I'll talk about uh, economic contribution of logging industry in, uh, in these three states reason and also potential economic impacts of projected uh, business closures uh, in the reason. Uh, for this, I, I closely worked with Dr. Jagdish Powdell from um, Michigan DNR and also Dr. Larry Lefers. Uh, they provided me guidance in uh, doing the study. Uh, the background, logging business uh, literature uh, expresses concern about uh, recruitment uh, for new workers and retention of logging, uh, uh, logging business employees. And uh, there are several reasons uh, for that. These include easing owners and employees, mechanization of logging businesses, uh, not so attractive wages and benefits package, 
downturns in forest products markets uh, because of economic recession, declining profit margins, and all of that. Uh, there was a study published in Journal of Forestry. Uh, it, it was a review article by Conrad Little, uh, 2018, and it noted a decline of close to 5,000 logging businesses and 35,000 logging workers in US from 1990 to 2016. And also there was a study by Rickenback Little, 2015, which noted 20% uh, of logging businesses in Wisconsin left their business between 2003 and 10, and another 19% indicated to exit uh, from the market in the short term future. So uh, given uh, this difficulty that uh, logging sector is having to retain and recruit uh, businesses, uh, we wanted to look at the economic contribution of in the industry so that uh, we can emphasize the importance of uh, logging industry uh, in our area. And also uh, these kind of study can help justify introduction and adoption of uh, supporting policies to help strengthen uh, the sector in the future. Uh, besides that, given the aging cohort of logging business owners across the country and projected loss in logging businesses, we wanted to see how uh, these could have uh, impact on local economies and related forest products industry sectors. So the specific research questions that we wanted to answer was, uh, what is the economic contribution of uh, logging sector and individual state and regional economy? How might forecasted closures of logging businesses affect local economies and related forest products industry sectors in the study area? And in case of lost capacity within state, how might the substitution of lost capacity through imports affect the contributions made by forest products industry sectors uh, within that state? For this, we used um, 2017 uh, impact analysis for planning data and software. Implan uh, is a widely used computer software package that allows its user to estimate uh, local input output models and associated databases based upon uh, uh, interrelationship between various producing and consuming sectors in the economy. Uh, it collects data from different government agencies, including Bureau of Labor Statistics, Economic Analysis, Census Bureau, uh, and other uh, state and local government agencies. We also supplemented it with uh, past survey data uh, these are the particular studies that we used uh, to supplement. Basically, what data we got was a uh, number of employees per logging business. So the economic uh, contribution and impact analysis uh, that we did for our study uh, is theoretically based upon input-output modeling approach, uh, uh, originally introduced by Dr. Wesley uh, Liantiv in 1930s. He later got a Nobel Prize in economics for, uh, for this method. Uh, and what this uh, method does is it allows us to answer questions like if there is a certain percent uh, uh, change in final demand for a product um, within a reason, then how uh, will that affect uh, the, the regional economy? Uh, so uh, mathematically, input-output model can be expressed uh, in a matrix form, uh, according to Miller and Blair. Uh, in this matrix form where X is equals to I minus A inverse Y, where X is a vector of gross industry outputs, Y is a vector of final demands, and A is the matrix of technical coefficients, which represents intermediate input supplied by industry I per unit of gross output in industry G. This matrix of multipliers I minus A inverse is also called D and T inverse, and it shows uh, how initial change uh, can have ripple effects in the economy. And the economic effects estimated using implan uh, can be divided into direct effects, indirect effects, and induced effects. So direct effects are initial effects to local industry from activity or policy that's being analyzed. Indirect effects uh, include uh, effects resulting from industry into industry uh, transactions. And induced effects uh, results uh, uh, from employees spending their wages. A combination of all three is the total effects. A quick uh, distinction between economic contribution and economic impact um, based upon Watson et al. 2017, uh, 2007, sorry. Uh, economic contribution estimates gross changes in a region's economy, which can be attributed uh, to an existing industry event or a policy. So if we wanna see uh, what the contribution of a particular industry is, say logging sector is, then we do economic contribution analysis. Now, economic impact analysis, on the other hand, it estimates net changes in new economic activity attributed to an industry event or policy in an existing regional economy. So if a new industry is opening in a region, 
or if uh, an industry that's already in the region is going to close, then what kind of uh, effect it'll have on the economy? That kind of um, that kind of analysis is done using economic impact analysis. Uh, for our study, we used uh, both of these. So first, we looked at economic contribution of logging sector uh, in each state uh, and the regional economy. Method employed was um, single sector economic contribution analysis. Uh, 2017 implant data uses 536 uh, distinct producing sectors, uh, industry sectors, based upon North uh, American Industrial Classification Code to represent US economy. Uh, out of that, um, commercial logging is represented by implant sector 16. We use matrix inversion method uh, to do uh, single sector economic contribution analysis. And then uh, for the uh, impact of projected business closures in each state, we use economic impact analysis. Uh, for this one, we created a hypothetical scenario where we assume that 20% uh, of logging businesses leave the market. Then what kind of impact will that have in each of these states? Uh, that's an arbitrary number that we used, but uh, based upon our survey findings and findings from other past surveys, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a reasonable number to use. So if 20% of logging businesses leave the market, then it results in a loss of 160 logging businesses in Michigan and 960 jobs. In Minnesota, it's 77 logging businesses and 385 jobs. And in Wisconsin, it's 182 logging businesses and 510 jobs. The numbers here in yellow tables are uh, uh, the numbers that we got from a uh, past survey and through contact with uh, DNR in each of, the, uh, each of the states. Next, to look at the economic uh, uh, effect of import substitution. Uh, what we did was uh, we, we looked at the implant models and identified sectors that use logs and groundwood, which are the commodity produced by logging businesses. Uh, and uh, we identified that there are 18 uh, different industry sectors, uh, 13 out of which are forest products industry that use logs and groundwood. Uh, and ideally, we should have looked at uh, uh, the effect uh, in all of these industries before uh, import substitution and after import substitution to see uh, the effect. But then for the sake of simplicity, we only consider top five forest products industry sectors that utilize logs and groundwood uh, in 2017 and, uh, and compared, uh, conducted economic contribution of those five sectors uh, before and after import substitution uh, and looked at the uh, change that resulted. Uh, in implant that can be done by modifying uh, what is called a regional purchase coefficient. And uh, that is, uh, proportion of total demand for a commodity by all users in the study area that is supplied by producers located within that area. Uh, so again, we reduced um, original RPC by 20% of its original value uh, and uh, looked at what effect of import substitution would be. Uh, economic measures considered for the study include uh, employment, which is full-time and part-time jobs as well as self-employed individuals labor income, which includes uh, employee compensation and proprietor income, value added, which includes labor income taxes and other pro uh, on production and import and other property taxes, and output includes value added plus intermediate inputs. And then there is SAM multiplier, which is a uh, sum of direct, indirect, and induced effects divided by the direct effect. So this gives uh, uh, how the effect is uh, ripples through the economy. This is the result uh, for the three states reason. So economic contribution uh, analysis result uh, for the uh, Lake State reason. We found that uh, across the region, uh, logging industry employs more than 12,000 uh, individuals and generates uh, 528.5 million in labor income. Uh, the, these numbers are all uh, 2017 dollars. Um, and then 643.6 uh, million in value added and uh, 911.5 million in direct uh, output, including indirect and induced uh, effects. Uh, the logging sector in, in the three states region employs uh, over 17,000 people and generates 774.8 million in labor income, 1,051.9 uh, million in value added and 1670.9 million in total output. The SAM multiplier values range from 1.5 uh, for employment to 1.8 for output. 
So what this uh, shows is that for every job created in the logging sector, it supports additional 0.5 jobs um, in the region, uh, in other related sectors. And for every uh, 1 million uh, in output uh, generated within the logging sector, it supports additional 800,000 uh, uh, worth of output in other related sectors within, within the region. Similar tables were obtained for Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. I don't think I'll go into these in detail. Uh, this shows a summary uh, kind, of, kind of graph. Uh, Wisconsin led the other two states in terms of uh, direct and total jobs from logging industry and also in terms of uh, total output generated. Uh, Michigan was the second, followed by uh, Minnesota. Next is the economic impact of projected business closures. So as I mentioned earlier, we looked at, uh, say, 960 jobs, direct logging jobs were lost in Michigan. Uh, then what that means is uh, that means that 34 million is lost in labor income, 39 million in value added, and 60 million in direct output. But including including um, indirect and induced effects, it translates into 1355 jobs in Michigan, 50.6 million in labor income, uh, 66 million in value added, and 106.3 million in uh, output. Again, similar thing for Minnesota, 385 job loss translates into a total loss of uh, uh, 497 jobs uh, within Minnesota. And in Wisconsin, 510 uh, direct logging job loss translates into 784 um, jobs lost uh, in um, Wisconsin. Uh, here is a summary of how it uh, ripples through the economy in terms of employment. So uh, 960 direct jobs lost in Michigan uh, leads to 143 indirect jobs that are lost within the state and 252 induced jobs are lost. And the major industry sectors affected are uh, these three, all other crop farming, support activities for agriculture and forestry, and forestry, forest products, and timber tract production. In Minnesota, again, uh, 385 direct job loss translates into uh, 46 indirect jobs lost, 67 induced jobs lost, and the major industry sectors affected are forestry, forest products, and timber tract production, um, all of the crop farming, wholesale trade, and support activities for agriculture and forestry. Uh, similar numbers for um, Wisconsin, 510 direct jobs lost translate into 68 indirect jobs and 206 induced jobs. And industry sectors affected are uh, sector 10, 19, and 395 wholesale trade. <clears throat> Next, as I mentioned earlier, to see the effect of import substitution, we looked at five industry sectors. These were electric power generation uh, using biomass. I can see that. Uh, sector 134, sawmills. Sector 136, veneer and plywood manufacturing, paper mills and paper board mills. In Minnesota, instead of um, veneer and plywood manufacturing, there was other mill work, including uh, flooring. So we looked at RPC, uh, original RPC uh, in, the, in the implant model for each of these states and saw that for Michigan, it was 0 0.76, uh, Minnesota 0 0.76 and Wisconsin 0 0.86. What this means is uh, in Michigan, 76% uh, of the total demand for logs and roundwood within the state was met by uh, logs and roundwoods produced uh, within Michigan. So, uh, this number here shows that Wisconsin is more self-reliant in terms of logs and roundwood than uh, Michigan and Minnesota. Now, uh, here's the economic contribution analysis uh, uh, result uh, before import substitution and after import substitution uh, for Michigan. So before import substitution, uh, these selected five forest products industry sectors employed uh, 6,573 people, uh, generated 542.5 million in labor income, 837.1 million in value added, and 3,466 million in total output. Um, direct, those are direct effects. And if you look at total effects, these numbers are much higher. And now this is, uh, this is the result after import substitution. Uh, and you see direct effects are still the same. But uh, when we look at the total effects, uh, indirect and induced effects, uh, resulting in total effects, uh, it reduces considerably. So employment reduces from 26,414 uh, to 25,524. All other economic measures uh, are reduced as well. 
Similar tables were obtained for uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And this here shows um, a summary of, uh, of the reduction. Uh, so because of import substitution, the number of jobs lost uh, uh, from these five selected sectors in Michigan were 867, in Minnesota 394, and the total jobs lost. And in Wisconsin, 1,088. Uh, uh, total labor income reduced uh, in Michigan by 32 million, in Minnesota by 11 million, in Wisconsin 59 million. Value added declined by 42 million in Michigan, 17 million in Minnesota, and 78 million in Wisconsin. And in terms of total output, uh, the reductions were 68 million in Michigan, 29 million in Minnesota, and 113 million uh, in Wisconsin. And the industry sectors that were affected the most were uh, commercial logging, wholesale trade, real estate, truck transportation, full service restaurants, and limited service restaurants. So key takeaways uh, from this study is that um, Logging sector directly employs over 12,000 people in the three states region and produces over $900 million in direct output, including ripple effects. The contributions are much higher. And there are 18 industry sectors, not only forest products industry sectors that use uh, logs and roundwood, um, but other sectors, um, uh, sporting, I forgot what is exactly called, but uh, something that makes sporting goods and also uh, um, I, I blanked out what, what that is called, but sectors that are uh, not considered forest products industry sectors. And then um, there are 13 forest products industry sectors that use logs and groundwood uh, as their inputs for production. And so changes in logging sector dynamics uh, will have significant effect on forest products industry in the region and their economic contributions. So if there is a, if there is a reduction in uh, logging capacity within the region. And if we import it uh, to meet local demand, uh, then there will be substantial loss in indirect and induced jobs, labor income, value added, and outputs within the state. So note of caution uh, is that uh, the scenario developed here and the model presented are based on simplifying assumptions uh, and uh, may or may not truly represent reality. Our intention here is uh, not to find exact numbers, uh, but to highlight uh, uh, how these industry sectors are related to each other and how change in one industry can have ripple effects on other related industries. And also input output models are based on assumptions of fixed input structure and do not consider changes that are possible as a result of technological advancements or price changes. So, um, so you should be cautious when uh, uh, explaining the results. Next step uh, for me particularly is uh, I'm working with Dr. Razu Pokhrel here in the department uh, and conducting network analysis uh, to look at the accessibility um, uh, ex to, for assessing availability and uh, competition for resources for our uh, logging respondents in Michigan. So we, we uh, located geocoded uh, the respondents and then looked at their uh, wood basket and made a cool looking map here, which shows, uh, see, this is the competition index. So the darker green color shows areas where there is less competition, less number of loggers uh, are competing for resources in these areas versus uh, some of these areas uh, where there are more than 20 logging uh, businesses uh, competing for resources in these areas. And looking at non-industrial private forest dependent uh, businesses and non-dependent businesses, and uh, what are the differences? So that's something that I'm working currently. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank my guidance committee, my major advisor, Dr. Ken Potterwitter, uh, Dr. Larry Lippers, uh, Dr. Huff, uh, Emily Huff, uh, Dr. Finley, and Pat Norris, and also uh, uh, Dr. Jagdish Powdell from Michigan DNR, and uh, Dr. Raju Pokhrel here uh, uh, in, in the department. Uh, also like to thank uh, the survey respondents who responded uh, to our survey and logging business survey team in all three states, um, especially Dr. Charlie Blinn and Dr. Mark Rickenback uh, from University of Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, with whom I worked closely uh, to produce a paper out of the first part of the presentation that I showed today. And also department, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the forestry department here 
and all other supporters who supported our survey. With that, I'd like to take uh, questions if you have any, and also thank you for listening to my talk today. Wonderful it, it job, really Siobhan. Thanks. Um, I will let you handle your own questions. There's uh, several in the chat already. And then if, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask questions, please feel free. Okay, so my cool data about, this is from Mike Smelligan. He said, cool data about an IPF dominating harvest volumes, invest, investing in 1500 loggers could be a more cost-effective way to help family forest landowners than trying to reach 200,000 landowners. Yep, I agree with that. And then are you presenting this data to Timber Association of Timbermen? Uh, I was not planning to do it, uh, but I can share these if, uh, uh, if they would be interested. Um, okay, so I think I already addressed Georgia's question. Uh, Wisconsin has higher response rates for FFO surveys than most states too. Good to know that. And under key takeaways, second point should read markets are dominated by a few. Adding A before a few changes the main. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Potterwitter. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll make that change. Um, for the smaller operations, did they indicate if they logged full time? Uh, 1,000 quads per year are a load per week, doesn't seem like a sustainable livelihood. Yeah, we, so we didn't ask our respondents if they operated full time or not. We should have included that question, uh, but most likely small producers didn't operate full time. So when we look at our small producers, they, they tend to be older people who have uh, like older equipment uh, and harvesting at, we're operating at lower percent of full capacity. So uh, maybe these are only uh, not year round loggers. Maybe they are only operating um, for a few months. And so that could be another reason why they don't want to invest in newer equipment uh, potentially, um, but we, we didn't ask that in our survey. Um, do the effects of import substitution include imports from neighboring states or just foreign import? It, it includes uh, importing from uh, any other. So we are looking at, if we are looking at Michigan model, it includes uh, importing from all other states, including foreign, everything outside of Michigan. Can you speak to whether increased competition is beneficial versus harmful uh, to small logging companies in a given area? So um, I guess that depends uh, for sm uh, small versus increased competition. Um, I think small produce based upon uh, what, uh, what we got in our uh, written section of the comments, uh, small producers said that they are having hard time competing with uh, larger producers and producers that are backed by mills uh, because they are because they are getting uh, for the same cord of wood uh, delivered, they're getting different prices, uh, lower prices. Uh, small producers are compared to large producers, uh, maybe because the mills want uh, a sustainable supply of their resources and they want to build a good relationship with, or vice versa, big, uh, big logging businesses have better relationship with uh, uh, these mills and they could, uh, they could be getting preferential treatment. So, um, so that means um, higher competition is not beneficial for uh, um, small producers in, in, in that sense. This one is, and this presentation would be good for SFI logger training. I have a doctor that should handle about getting these survey results on. But, uh, I have not, but uh, I could definitely do that. So if you wanted to put together one page of I think I'll do that, Dr. Huff. Yeah, and I was going to also selfishly ask you if you'd be willing to um, summarize this in a magazine article for Michigan Forests for MFA, too. So that would be a landowner audience. But um, I think everybody wants to hear about this work is the summary. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll definitely do that. Yep. 
Fantastic. We can the data and it'll be it'll be useful if it uh, if it goes out to inform. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, we're exactly at 4:30, so thank you everybody for attending today. Um, I am rotating off as chair of Hanover, so look for a, a new lineup next year um, with new leadership, but a huge round of applause again to Siobhan. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful way to end our series and have a great week, everybody. Thank you.